Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. Wyoming's Red Desert on the next Wyoming Chronicle. The Red Desert is a vast expanse of land that defines South Central Wyoming and is considered to encompass the Green River, Great Divide, and Washakie Basins, almost 10 million acres. Renowned research geologist Charles Ferguson remarked in Anne Prue's book, The Red Desert, that there are very few places on Earth where the rocks are older, but none have such a history. This is because the Red Desert is also exceptionally young. While many view the Red Desert as a vast wasteland as they race from Rollins to Rock Springs on Interstate 80 at 80 miles an hour, others see some of the most spectacular views Wyoming has to offer. As we enjoy Wyoming photographer Nicholas Wagner's stunning time-lapse photography, we realize that the Red Desert is more than an empty wasteland full of just sagebrush and dust. Humans, it is thought, first lived in the Red Desert beginning 12,000 years ago during the transitional period that marked the end of the last ice age. Then many believed large bison was the primary staple. Hunters killed large game with spears tipped with beautifully crafted projectile points until environmental changes led to the loss of forage for large animals. Some researchers also believe that big game may not have been quite as important and that animals like jackrabbits were hunted extensively. Evidence in the form of rock art and petroglyphs can be found at Boar's Tusk, Seedskadi, and in the East Flaming Gorge areas, Native American history is abundant in the Red Desert. Many believe that trappers reached Southwest Wyoming in the early 1800s. The Red Desert's ranching industry started with sheep grazing well before the cattle boom of the 1870s and 80s. Since sheep eat snow for water, local men established flocks in and around the Red Desert. Generations of American families beginning in the 1840s also left their mark upon the Red Desert as they migrated westward along immigrant trails. The environmental impact of an estimated 350,000 pioneers and their wagon trains traveling through Wyoming between 1841 and 1868 is still visible today. However, most trail ruts are less dramatic, but still evidence of a people's history worn into the earth. Historical trails used by the 19th century stagecoaches are also part of the Red Desert's legacy. Of particular note, the Overland Stage initially followed the Platte River and the Oregon Trail to South Pass, but later shifted to a route across southern Wyoming. Stagecoach ruts in the desert are still visible in a variety of locations, including north of Bags. A short-lived gold rush in the Red Desert's mountains to the north, beginning in 1867, led to stage and freight service from Point of Rocks on the Union Pacific Railroad north to South Pass City. Today, the Red Desert sees many uses. The area is the focus of energy development, but about 10% of the Red Desert remains protected. In the early 1970s, renowned geologist Dr. David Love and others championed the need to protect some of the Red Desert from more development. Such efforts continue today. Today we are in the Miner's Delight Inn in Atlantic City, Wyoming, on the northern edge of Wyoming's Red Desert, a 9,000 plus square mile high desert in South Central Wyoming. Almost 80 years ago, Wyoming's governor proposed that a large portion of the Red Desert become a national park. It's the home of 350 species of wildlife, including the country's largest migratory herd of pronghorn, mule deer, and also, reportedly, the world's largest herd of desert elk. The Red Desert is also the home of over 1,000 plant species. 50 million years ago, the Red Desert in Southern Wyoming was alive, but with catfish, turtles, crocodiles and flamingos in heavily forested and off-flooded shorelines. Today, the Kilpecker sand dunes stretch 55 miles in the Red Desert and are open to off-road vehicles. These living dunes are one of North America's largest fields. World-class energy deposits in the Red Desert include oil shale, natural gas, uranium, coal, and trona. Today, we've assembled a wonderful panel. 
to learn more and understand the issues related to Wyoming's Red Desert. Jenny Treffren is a BLM community organizer and BLM outreach associate for the Lander Office of the Wyoming Wilderness Association. She focuses on advocating for balanced BLM land uses and has a particular emphasis on advocating protection for undeveloped BLM lands, such as wilderness study areas, citizens' wilderness proposal areas, and wild and scenic rivers. Dick Enberg is the president of the Governing Council of the Wyoming Wilderness Association, a founder and two-time chapter president of the Wind River Backcountry Horsemen, and is a retired professional land surveyor. John Mayansinski is a naturalist, a wildlife biologist, researcher, author, musician, and has explored the northern red desert in Wyoming for decades. By many accounts, John understands the issues more about the northern red desert in particular than maybe anyone else. And John, I want to start with you and to, to, to my panel welcome everyone. Twelve years ago, a colleague of mine wrote that few people outside of Wyoming know about the red desert, and that's partly why this national treasure is in jeopardy. Is that still the case today? There's no doubt about that. Uh, if more people knew about it, I think more people would understand the issues and also be familiar with the rare uh, opportunities there are there for recreation and wildlife uh, viewing, hunting. And uh, I, I would say unequaled vastness and solitude. Uh, of a pristine area. It's kind of like a national park where you don't have to pay to get in and nobody tells you what the rules are. <clears throat> John, when you were a child, you grew up on the East Coast, but you ended up here. How and why? Well, that's not a simple story, but it happened in 1967 uh, due to the convergence of a few factors. First, I had a heart condition and uh, I could only walk short distances at a time. and. Uh, uh, one of the, the physiologists I saw said the best thing you can do is walk. Well, that was in the back of my mind. I started walking everywhere and a lot, and it was getting better. And then uh, I always uh, liked deserts since several years before that. I was spent some time in the Mojave Desert and uh, fell in love with deserts as a, a kind of a landscape that pleases me, a personal thing. And then in 67, I got drafted. And uh, I packed up and was ready to go to the draft board. I was living in Minnesota at the time. And uh, another letter showed up just before I was to go to the draft board. And uh, the letter said, sorry, we counted the wrong number. You're actually free. So I went to the Red Desert to think about things. Because I'd been to uh, visit Wyoming several times and hunted and fished in Wyoming in 64 and 65 and uh, in 67, I was intrigued with the map. And this big white spot on the road map was the Red Desert, and I didn't know anything about it. So I thought, well, I'm not going in the Army right now. I'll just um, go see this place I've really been intrigued with from no more understanding than what a road map can tell you, and got out there and that summer fell in love with it. And we'll get back to the many things that you've done <clears throat> here in the Red Desert and, and the work that you've done, um, certainly um, today. But um, Dick, I want to ask you, you first started surveying the Red Desert in the 1960s. Early 1960s, that's correct, yes. And it was uh, during the 1960s uranium boom and uh, worked in uh, a lot of the Red Desert, Pickett Lake area particularly, there was a prospect there. I worked there in the winter of, I think, about 1968. Uh, and we fought a four-wheel drive, chained up four-wheel drive pickup uh, into the Pickett Lakes area from Riverton. Took us a whole day. And then we did our job out there, which was staking uranium claims. Uh, at that time, uh, during the middle of the winter, we did that by flying daily in from Riverton, landing on uh, old seismograph roads or something on a ridge top, and then working and being picked up at the end of the day, which we really didn't know whether we were going to get picked up or not. So <laughs> we were prepared to spend the night there, but we didn't have to. And the Red Desert's a tough place in the wintertime, I'll tell you that. 
Dick, I know that you um, worked with and founded, helped found the Wind River Backcountry Horsemen. To me, that's the Wind River Range. But really, um, you've fallen in love with the Red Desert and um, have, have taken as many or many pack trips there also. Um, why, why the interest still today? Well, because uh, of the Backcountry Horsemen, of course, the name Backcountry means that uh, that's where the organization does best is in our back country. And uh, we're not a riding club. We're not an arena club. We're back country horsemen. And there's a lot of back country and areas in the Red Desert to pack trip into, take trips into, which we did. And uh, kind of a strange place to, you might say, pack into because there isn't any place to tie off. You know, in the mountains, we always have trees to tie to. So in the Red Desert, you have to be pretty careful uh, to keep your uh, animals uh, uh, picketed to the ground because we also have the uh, wild horses in the Red Desert. And sometimes we have trouble with our stock and some of the studs in the, in the wild horse bunch. Sure, sure. Jenny, I want to ask you, um, this fall, I asked you mm -hmm. what your most favorite place in Wyoming was. And I was mm -hmm. expecting an answer, the Tetons, the Yellowstone, mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the Snowy Range. But, um, but it surprised me that, that that's not the case. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your most favorite place in Wyoming. Right. Well, my most favorite place in Wyoming is right around the Honeycomb Buttes area. In a lot of ways, I look back and how I've grown up in Wyoming, and I think I was really set up to love the Honeycomb Buttes throughout my life. And when I found it, I felt like... I was home really. I've had an interest in Wyoming's history for a really long time and there's no place like the northern Red Desert especially that really encompasses Wyoming history and specifically the Honeycomb Buttes. You talk about the Oregon trails and the other trail corridors that go through that area, the history of the wildlife that's there, the archaeology that's there, the geology that's there, and then also the recreation opportunities and this just forms this perfect little package of everything that I'm interested in that I want to read about that I want to go do that I want to look at and where I really want to be and so to me the Red Desert is Wyoming and I love Wyoming. And is it the solitude that you enjoy the most? I would say absolutely if I had to pick one characteristic of the Honeycomb Buttes in particular in the Red Desert it would be the solitude and in the Honeycomb Buttes, you can get lost in the little gulches and drainages, and you can go days and days without seeing anybody. And if you get lost, somebody's probably not going to find you for several seasons. <laughs> John, you, um, you've guided motorcycle tours in the Red Desert. Yeah. Um, people who blow by the, the Red Desert on I-80 are looking at what they might perceive as a wasteland, but you see something very, very different. Well, it can look like a wasteland from Interstate 80. Uh, you're moving at high speed, you're not looking carefully at the ground. But even some territory down in the south end of the desert near Interstate 80 was some of my favorite places. Uh, Red Desert Flats is, is only 15 miles north of Interstate 80 and it's fascinating in there. Even though it's a monoculture of uh, greasewood and, and flat ground, it's got little uh, horned lizards and things that you could see if you look close. But uh, my favorite place is probably Honeycomb Buttes and, uh, today. I think it's protected now. It's a lot different than it was 40 years ago. Uh, you couldn't camp it most of the summer season. You couldn't really set up a camp down in the bottoms between the buttes and between the escarpments because there were sheep everywhere. And you never knew when they were going to come running through. Uh, so you camped up high on the tops of the ridges and uh, badlands. But it's incredibly beautiful country, and uh, I think that's my favorite place on the planet. On the planet? Yes. And you've been, you've been to many. Um, Dick, how about you? Um, if you were to go anywhere in the Red Desert, um, uh, and if you were to say that, that uh, a pl certain place that you like the best, what would you tell me? I would have to say the Oregon Buttes. Mm -hmm. I've been to Honeycomb Buttes and they kind of blend together when it, when it gets right down to it. Honeycomb Buttes and the, and the Oregon Buttes. But the Oregon Buttes to me has a larger uh, variety of wildlife. Uh, we have the desert elk, we have the pronghorn, we have moose, we have uh, 
uh, deer and, and everything in that particular area. And it's a little more of a variety from, uh, you might say your real sagebrush lowlands up into a little higher elevation with some trees. And so I kind of like the Oregon Buttes. Jenny, I want to talk to you about your work. Um, sure. <clears throat> um, you work to essentially provide a lot of educational resources to folks about mm -hmm. the Red, Red Desert. Um, what is your, 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 your main, main task in, um, in what it is that you do for the Wyoming Wilderness Association relative to the Red Desert? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, ultimately, of course, the Wyoming Wilderness Association would like to see a protection package put together for the Red Desert that recognizes and protects its current values. But something that John touched on earlier that is most the most critical step to this right now is educating people about the Red Desert, letting them know what's out there, getting them out there. So in terms of achieving that, we host public education outings every summer and fall where we take people out on a variety of outings. Now this can be a botany-based outing, this can be a wildlife-based outing, this can just be a driving tour, historic outing. We've hosted painting workshops, photography workshops car camping trips, all sorts of things of that nature. Additionally, last year, in conjunction with the Wyoming Outdoor Council and the National Outdoor Leadership School, we hosted a half marathon trail run down in, in the northern Red Desert as well. And so really getting over that lack of awareness of the Red Desert right now, I see, is one of the most critical components of my job. John, what's the best way to do that? Um, what's the best way to, um, to uh, and does everyone think that's a good thing? to let people know of this, um, oh, um, no. this area that's, that's uh, <laughs> maybe not known by everyone um, in such an expansive part of south, southern, south central Wyoming. Well, I, I can't speak for Jenny, but I imagine she went through an evolution like I did, and I imagine Dick did too, where there's certain little nooks and crannies in Oregon Buttes and uh, Honeycombs and Bush Rim and Steamboat Mountain that you hang out there for a while and it becomes your personal little getaway place and you don't want anyone else to know about it. And I'd say through the 60s and half of the 70s, that's the way I felt about the Red Desert. I went out there with, with friends I really liked and we'd look for fossils or we'd um, uh, watch animals, watch the elk. But the reason I became an outfitter, and I was an outfitter out there for over 15 years, one of the first outfitters in the honeycombs, uh, was because in the late 70s there was an oil boom that was subsidized by the government, meaning you didn't necessarily have to find oil to spend a lot of money going to a place and, and putting in roads and drilling rigs. And that meant they were all over, and companies uh, that were drilling for oil came from other places. Uh, mostly Texas and other states, so the places to be explored with seismograph trucks and uh, rigs were grid lines on a map. Nobody had been there to look at the ground until the truck showed up. So there wasn't any respect for the land and the landforms. And I was personally offended by the invasion of the honeycombs in the late 70s. So I uh, went and wrote some articles for High Country News went to High Country News asking if anybody knew if they could do anything, and they did. They gathered up some environmental groups and uh, really were the first initiative to set up the wilderness study areas under the leadership, I think, it um, uh, was Bruce Hamilton that kind of led that charge. He was with High Country News then. But uh, I became an outfitter uh, in... Uh, the first to guide to take people out there to, from the Teton Science School and describe it as an ecological wonder of Wyoming, which it is. But if you come from Jackson Hole, where the Teton Science School is, it's also a, a great novelty to have close by. It only takes three hours to drive there from Jackson. And you've got a completely different environment that's just as pristine as the national parks, maybe more so. You don't have congested highways or uh, checkpoints. Uh, uh, gates where you have to go through and show a pass, so you can just go there and enjoy it. Dick, uh, you're working with the Wild Wyoming Wilderness Association. You're you're president of, of its board. Yes, uh, I am. <clears throat> what What's your take on um, first? Should uh, should parts of the Red Desert be protected? 
I would assume that you would agree it should. And the best Absolutely. way, and the best way that, that that should be approached is should they become wilderness areas? Is be, being designated a wilderness study area adequate? Should it become a national park? What, what's your take on that? Uh, the the ability to turn part of the Red Desert into a national park, I think, is long past. I think we gave that up when we formed uh, Teton Park. So we're not going to have the Red Desert be a park. And let, let, me, have, let me ask you about that right there. Why was that given up, so to speak? It was a political move in order to get uh, Teton National Park. Uh, the congressional delegation agreed not to form any other national parks in the state. We gave that right up. So uh, I think that uh, right now in the Red Desert, we have 11 wilderness study areas. They've been selected by the BLM uh, as wilderness study areas and uh, supposedly are supposed to be treated as wilderness until, of course, Congress acts on the uh, wilderness. Now, uh, wilderness study areas are you might say administratively protected. So administrative protection does not mean anything if you've dealt with our public land agencies as I have over the last years. But uh, uh, wilderness study areas, we, we would like to see these receive the ultimate protection which is wilderness designation by Congress. Jenny, do you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Is is um, you 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 understand mm -hmm. the, the the current relationship as wilderness study areas in the Red Desert? Mm -hmm. What's your take and what's your position mm -hmm. relative to the long term um, solution, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, protecting what's left to protect in the Red Desert? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, I have two parts to that question. The first for me is an more ideologically and not ideologically but idealist take. On it, whereas I would say, if I look at all the wilderness study areas that are in the Red Desert, it's less than three percent of the whole Red Desert, and I think that's a really reasonable number to give the ultimate protection. We're not asking for half. We're not asking for seventy-five percent. We're ultimately asking for about two hundred and thirty thousand acres out of around six million acres. So idealistically, yes, it would be great to protect these areas, to protect their archaeological values, their historic values, their recreational values, and also note that that helps preserve some of our ranching heritage because grazing can continue in wilderness areas. But then realistically, I don't know if that is still possible even if we're talking about 3% because a lot of times things have to be given up. Now there are some wilderness area study areas in the Red Desert that are becoming almost islands. You see oil and gas development completely encircling those. And whether or not those are realistically going to become wilderness in the future or should be, that's another question entirely that I'm not quite certain on the answer yet, mostly because I think we're not quite there yet on making decisions based on that. There needs to be more stakeholder discussion before I give a firm answer on that. And how are those discussions going to occur in your, in your eyes? How, mm -hmm. um, what's the BLM's role? Mm -hmm. um, um, what's your organization's role? Mm -hmm. what, what do you perceive happening mm -hmm. in the short term in the next five years or so? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, this may be refutable from other people, but I really think that the BLM's role in conversations like this is to provide information to stakeholders, to be the people that have the information on these lands and that can help give names around and bring people together. But really when it comes down to it, the BLM is the agency that is in charge of managing these lands for the public. And it's the public's decision to make how these lands are made. I don't think that it's necessarily the BLM's within the BLM's discretion if we're talking about permanent protections that come from Congress. Rather, that should come from the public, that should come from the stakeholders, that should come from the people that use this land and what they want to happen. And so my organization's role within that would be, of course, to put forward what our members' views are for these lands. You know, we are a backcountry oriented organization where we look for undeveloped BLM lands and advocate base to protect those lands. But then additionally, we would also hope to be one of the main conveners in the sense that we are only based in Wyoming, we're composed of local people, and we have a very down-to-earth approach about what's going on in these areas. And we would like to have open conversations with stakeholders, whether it's oil and gas companies, whether it's grazing associations, anything like that, and say, what do you really need? 
and hopefully be a key part of those conversations. I want to thank my panel, Jenny Treferin, Dick Inberg, and John Mayansinski for this first part of our two-part discussion on Wyoming's Red Desert. We'll explore the Red Desert more next week on Wyoming Chronicle.